Okay, episode 504 is going to be brought to you by Rapid Release Technology Pro 2. This is an awesome, awesome thing to have in your arsenal for your family, for yourself. It's a tool that uses high vibrational therapy to massage trigger points, to get rid of trigger points, to really, really bring deep relaxation into any area of your body that you have pain. And I use it on my lower back. I use it every single day, actually, now that I've been doing a standing desk. I use it on my knees, my joints. I believe that it helps to decrease calcification of the joints. I use it after my workouts as well to break down lactic acid. Acid. I use it to relieve headaches. I use it over all of my organs at night. Before I go to bed, I stimulate all of my organs. You can use it in so many different ways. And a lot of people use it for relieving joint pains, injuries. People use it after surgery to speed up healing and to stimulate organs. It helps to calm sore muscles. A lot of chiropractors and massage therapists around the country are now using this tool. I highly recommend it. It's the only tool that got me out of debilitating back pain a few months back. And so we'll put a link to that on this page. And we're also brought to you by the Bellicon Rebounder. The Bellicon is awesome. It's an amazing, amazing piece of equipment, fitness equipment. I used to think that only people in the 70s would do rebounding, but I love it. I love it. It helps to increase bone density. And during this episode, we talked about the pelvic floor. It helps to strengthen the pelvic floor. It helps to stimulate every single muscle and cell in your body. No other exercise can do that. And it helps to detoxify lymphatic fluid. And, and I do it before I go into the sauna. This particular Bellicon is, has foldable legs. It's got a bar you can use in case you're worried about balance. It uses flexi rope. So it's silent. The legs fold in. It comes with a warranty. It's the best rebounder on the market today, and it's so beneficial for your health. I highly, highly recommend rebounding on a daily basis to prevent disease, stimulate the body, increase circulation, and increase cardiovascular flow. It is awesome. So if you're interested in the Bellicon Rebounder or the Rapid Release Technology Pro, I will put both those links at extremehealthradio.com slash 504, and they'll both be available in our store as well. Today's going to be a fun show with Dr. Kelly Starrett. I'm really excited about having him on. We just had a fun conversation before we started the show. And his website is mobilitywad.com. And I was first introduced to his work um, from a friend of mine at the gym that I no longer attend. But uh, he was telling me all about his book, Becoming a Supple Leopard. And so I started looking into his work and his website. He does some awesome stuff over on mobilitywad.com. So check that out. We'll introduce him in just a second, just to let you guys know, this is episode 504 of Extreme Health Radio. So if you want to listen to the show on the website, or I'll try to put down a couple of links um, if we mention any links. It's challenging for me to put all the links, but I'll put some of the links uh, on that show page as well as a link to his website. And if you want to check out any of the sponsors for today's show, you can go to extremehealthradio.com slash 504 and I'm currently doing this from a stand-up desk so I hope Kelly will will um, appreciate that uh, <laughs> so uh, it's really really cool he's uh, the author of like I said his first book becoming a supple leopard the ultimate guide to resolving pain preventing injury and optimizing athletic performance his second book ready to run which I want to check that one out because um, he talks a lot about the gait and um, and how your body is supposed to anatomically run um, Unlocking Your Potential to Run Naturally is the subtitle of that one. But today we're going to be talking about uh, his newest book. And he's been going around doing all kinds of interviews everywhere. His newest book is called Desk Bound, Standing Up to a Sitting World. And I've got some um, a couple things I pulled up off the internet today. Let me pull those up. Um, so it says here, as soon as you sit, the electrical activity of the leg muscle shuts off. This is talking about how sitting wrecks your body. Calorie burning drops to one per minute. Enzymes that help break down fat drop by 90%. And then after two hours of sitting, good cholesterol drops 20%. And after 24 hours, I don't know if anyone's ever sat for 24 hours. I guess maybe they have. Uh, Insulin effectiveness drops drops 24%. 
and risk of diabetes rises. Um, and people with sitting jobs have twice the rate of cardiovascular disease as people with standing jobs. This is crazy, right? Um, let me read one more thing here. Sitting increases risk up to uh, of death up to 40%. Sitting for six plus hours per day makes you up to 40% likelier to die within 15 years than someone who sits less than three, even if you exercise. And that is the big thing that really got me because it, for me, when I first realized that it doesn't matter how much I exercise, if I'm sitting for uh, such a long period of the day, uh, it really has no effect. The exercise that is has no effect on any of that stuff. So we're going to talk to Kelly about how to fix all this stuff and um, some of the dangers of sitting down. So thanks so much, Kelly, for joining the show today. Oh, my pleasure. That laundry list, you just it sounds pretty scary, that sitting stuff, right? Dude, I know. It's crazy. When I That was the thing that really got me when I realized that because when I first realize that, you know, because I'm a big gym person. I love working out. I love surfing. I love uh, hiking and, you know, all this kind of outdoor activity stuff. And I figured, you know, I'm doing a lot of that. So, you know, obviously if I sit a lot, it won't matter. But that really is not the case, is it? <laughs> it's like smoking and, and jogging at the same time. <laughs> yeah. Well, here, here's how let's reframe this, because I think the risk is to say sitting is bad and standing is good, right? And that's that's a little bit too too simplified and oversimplified for our tastes. Okay. Let's say this. Let's pan way back and say, what are we supposed to do as human beings? What what environment did we come up in? What environment shaped us? And then what are the conditions that allow us to correctly and more appropriately express our physiology? Because we know you can sit all day long and chain smoke and, you know, eat a little chocolate donut once in a while and still be the best in the world at something. Like we have this extraordinary physiology. It's right. pretty badass. Yeah. Comma, well, it turns out that the real question is not sit or stand. The real question is, am I moving or not? And, and you know, you, you're the opening, you know, factoid that you started with is, hey, when you sit down, electrical current, you know, electrical, you know, activity in your leg shuts off. Well, it turns out when you sit down, you literally you just don't need your leg musculature, and so it just sort of goes dormant. Mm -hmm. And and that's a really interesting indication of, of sort of the adaptation error that happens when we stop moving. And I think that's that's really – we can get into a little bit more granular about sort of the, the distinction between sedentary and non-sedentary. But when you sit down, for example, and you stop contracting your leg musculature, you stop pumping your lymphatic system, which mm -hmm. is how you – decongest, how you clear swelling, how you clear waste fluid, how you circulate your immune system. Mm -hmm. And if you've ever flown or sat a long time and had cankles, that is a direct result <laughs> of not moving your legs, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, if you're in the hospital, they have to put on these special boots that pump your legs for you because you're not moving because you're in the hospital bed. And and so well, suddenly you're like, well, well, is it really about sitting or is it about not moving? And then that, that gives us permission to ask a different set of questions. Right. So it's not about people who are sitting long periods of time have a problem. It's about people who are inactive. And we have a really nice little threshold that if you fall below one and a half metabolic equivalents, which is sort of the unit of metric of oxygen consumption that allows us to say that, you know, how much energy we're, we're u producing or using, right? Uh -huh. Energy expenditure. And if that's what, if you've ever been on an old school treadmill, it's like a met. I'm working at seven mets. I don't know what that is, but I'm, it's fairly hard. <laughs> right. Well, it turns out that we can define sedentary behavior is any behavior that falls below one and a half metabolic equivalents. And okay. it turns out that sitting is one of those behaviors that sits down, especially if I'm sitting sort of unsupported and not active. Mm -hmm. And now we can start to be a little bit more clear. Well, hey, sitting or engaged in sedentary activities more than six hours a day, automatically f I fall into that category of, of sedentary lifestyle. Uh -huh. And one of the things that we know for people is that it's actually really difficult sometimes to, to, to get us moving above that threshold because by the time we add in all the meetings I had to sit in, right. the commute to work, right, dinner, you know, the, the quick office lunch coffee I had to have, got wow. to have, all of a sudden you're like, whoa, 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 I, that just crept up. Right. And the recommendation, remember that the World Health Organization now, and these are the, you know, the, the people who are looking at the epidemiology at a big global level – are saying sedentary lifestyle is the fourth biggest global killer annually. And so what we're seeing is that ultimately the problem is that we're not just being 
good human beings. We're not being good stewards of our physiology. Mm -hmm. And the, the solution to that is not complicated. It's to move more. But when you're in a chair, you sort of preclude your movement options. And when you stand up, then you have lots of movement options. And so you don't ever need to fear sitting down. What you need to do is fear not moving for long periods of time. Mm -hmm. You know, what was really cool, uh, sort of eye-opening to me in one of your previous talks was um, this idea that um, I think you likened sitting down or using a chair as like a almost like a crutch or a, a way to mobilize your spine instead of the muscles around your spine doing that work itself. I thought that was really interesting. Well, I think you're, you're absolutely right. And I think one of the ways to think about this is, you know, when any structure of our body gets braced, becomes weak, right? Mm -hmm. Right. So if I brace your ankle and you don't have to use your ankle, you know, and this is what we've seen with arch support. So an arch support is a temporary solution to a foot problem mm -hmm. where the structure of the foot is collapsing. But if I don't have to rely on the intrinsic musculature of my connective tissue of my mechanics to support the foot, then the foot becomes weaker. And we saw this as a large scale experiment with in the like nineties. Remember there was that big fad where everyone in a warehouse had a belt on. Yeah. Remember I remember that. Yeah. Well, it turns out <laughs> low back injuries in warehouse workers with belts skyrocketed. Cause you know what happens if you wear a belt all the time, you don't have to do anything. The belt is acting like an exoskeleton abdominal suit. Right. And so you just lean into the belt and subsequently you become weaker and weaker and weaker. And we can look at the chair as sort of the same way. It's a, this, you know, I have this surrogate spine who's doing all the work, and then I just shut off all my abdominal musculature. And remember, when I start turning lights off on the body, I start down-regulating physiologic function. Mm -hmm. I am burning less calories. I'm, I'm not being active. I'm not supporting my structure. I'm sort of, you know – using a big brace like uh you know there's that that kid who broke his back in middle school and who was in a brace all the time mm -hmm. i mean that's what we're doing all the time and that's that's great when i have to drive that's very useful right, right. right. it's great if i'm an astronaut and i'm, I'm experiencing huge g-forces that's good to support the spine in those positions mm -hmm. but otherwise what we want people to realize is and do is say hey we want you to be as active as you can and the only thing you need to do is move forward in your chair. So don't use the chair. And then when you're exhausted and you need to take a break and think, lean back. Oh, it feels good. Then come back on and be awake and attention. Mm -hmm. So, but, you know, once again, I think the problem is, you know, we were able to buffer this to some extent in the 50s, 60s, 70s in our own old history right. because there were fewer additional sedentary inducing behaviors around us there was not netflix and chilling when i was in the you know when i was a little kid <laughs> right, you know we watched right. mork and mindy flipper you know, gilligan's <laughs> island that was it yeah and now we've got you know the research is that the average adult is spending two and a half to four hours a day on their smartphone and that kids from eight to 18 are about in front of a screen on average about 11 hours a day and that's schoolwork home tv messaging home or like you know my daughter is it a connected middle school uh -huh. and it's a it's it's called a google school and everything they do is on the google drive right so that all the google docs you know that everything's connected that way so we have a chromebook that goes a lot of places and a lot of her work and communication and and you know school work is done through the chromebook okay and so it's really you know i can't go into the school and be like no we're going backwards you know that we're pulling out the screens in fact i love taboo i love TV shows, you know, the OA, we uh -huh. just rock that, we're watching The Crown. <laughs> but what we realize is that all of those sort of environmental changes have aggregated into some significant changes in our fundamental movement behavior. And that is, we're not moving as much as we used to. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think one of the things that we can say unequivocally is that we get a lot of context cues from our environment. And we've never really thought consciously about how the environment may impact the physiology. What mm -hmm. we do is we say, hey, this mid-century modern couch looks fantastic, mm -hmm. right? We don't think to ourselves, hey, does my physiology, is my physiology really supported by this environment or am I just conforming the physiology to the environment? Mm -hmm. And I think that really is the distinction. So yeah. in our house, for example, when we watch TV, our girls sit cross-legged on the couch, 
right, supporting themselves like it was the ground, or I literally sit on the ground and when I'm watching the TV and lean up against the couch. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's so, you know, I'm not sure if it was you or if it's someone else that I was listening to a couple years ago talking about this idea of like a cast and uh, um, all of these modern conveniences, like, you know, having heat in your home. And before the show, we're just talking about, you know, you live up in, uh, you know, a little north of San Francisco, so it's cold. And, you know, people having all of these modern amenities, you know, and being indoors, breathing indoor air, sitting on couches and things like that. And this this uh, person, I forget what they, they, they sort of likened it to a cast in the sense that everything you do um, in our modern culture is causing us to ca- causing us to only be able to move within a certain restricted area. Like inside a cast, you can't really move your arm. And so in the same way, this, it's like a life cast. And so everything that we're doing is making us weaker and weaker and weaker. But the, but the real issue is crazy is that when you sit down, you don't feel bad. You don't feel weak. You don't feel anything. And so that's what's the hard part about it. Well, and I think th- this is the – at some point, it's important to recognize that we have this extraordinary physiology that lets us get away with murder. It's yeah. fantastic. <laughs> we can do a lot of amazing things with this physiology. It's true. But simultaneously, we have to we have to recognize that a lot of the musculoskeletal problems, a lot of the dysfunction we see down the road, is really made today in in, in a phenomenon we call self organized criticality. And the problem is that the time frame all on all of these experiments n of one. You know, I can drink a coke every single day, and you know, my teeth may rot in a year or so. I don't have to floss now, but uh, mm-hmm. flossing is probably important to me eventually when my right. teeth fall out, right? And it's difficult to sort of correlate immediate behaviors with, with, with dysfunction. And, and that's really an important switch right. is that the way we've kind of been selling health – to people is saying, you know, eat this way or else, exercise or else. You know, you're going to get cancer. You know, elbow cancer will will hit you. You know, and mm-hmm. and that's not really that scare tactic. Isn't really aspirational. It do, you know, I you know, I have a lot of friends who are like, bro, I'm I'm the best in the world. Like, you know, I'm eating pancakes whenever I want. You know, and mm-hmm. um, I you know, I don't have to sleep because I'm still the best in the world. And I think what we need to do is is point to the fact that. If you engage in changes in behavior that upregulate the physiology of the human, you will experience greater output today. You will sleep better. You will be more lucid. You, you know, drink water because it's important. But if you drink some water this week, you're going to look like you have a facelift by the end of the week, mm-hmm. and your skin will be clear. Mm-hmm. Right? People are like, "Oh, well, come in." You know, mm-hmm. you know, if you sleep better then you will be able to train harder or be more lucid at work. You know, you won't need that caffeine bump at four o'clock. Right. And so I think what we have done a poor job of is connecting loss of capacity with changes in behavior. So, you know, if, if you're sitting down listening to this, you know, you're breathing, but you're not breathing well. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. And so if, if, if you're sitting down listening, I, say, I challenge you, take a breath. And what you'll see is that you just took a breath up in your chest, up in your neck, which is not where your diaphragm is. Well, it turns out that when you sit down, you compress your diaphragm and you actually sort of downregulate that diaphragm function. And so now you start breathing in the place where you're still able to breathe, which is up in your chest and up in your neck, Mm -hmm. which is what we call apical or accessory breathing. And that accessory breathing is really expensive metabolically. It's inefficient. It tightens up my neck. It it triggers movements in my brain. My brain's like, oh, you're breathing in your neck. You must be stressed because the only time people breathe up in their necks is when they are breathing really hard and running away from grizzly bears. Mm-hmm. And um, so what ends up happening is you end up patterning this really inefficient breathing. It's shallow breathing. Mm-hmm. You're not accessing the diaphragm effectively. You're not accessing your parasympathetics. You're not ventilating efficiently. Your pH of your blood is a little bit different, Right. There's one diaphragm here at your trunk, you know, at the bottom of the ribcage. Well, there's another diaphragm called your pelvic floor. Mm-hmm. Turns out there's a, you know, adult diaper industry in the United States is a multi-billion dollar industry. Mm-hmm. So we need to ask ourselves, you know, what is it about our, these positions that have challenged or seen a downregulation in function when I can change my position and upregulate my function? And that's more an important argument and a little bit more honest than, 
posture, bad posture causes pain. Well, bad mm-hmm. posture causes loss of function, mm-hmm. and that may or may not mean something to you right this second, but I guarantee you it will mean something to you when you need it. Yeah, so true. Hey, Kaylee, what are your thoughts about uh, people texting and, and getting that what they call text neck? I don't have a, a phone, but I do have an iPod Touch that I'll use for our Instagram and stuff. But whenever I use it, I'll always sort of squat down so that I bend at my hip and so that my my spine and my neck are all sort of straight in one in, you know in a straight line so i'm not I'm not tilting my neck. What are your thoughts about that that whole texting thing and the text neck? Well, you know what I will tell you is that if I sustain any position for a long time, my body begins to recognize that position as its default. That's a learned position. And then I'll start to see associated tissue changes that support that position. Okay. So, um, you know, if I'm hinged over at the neck, then I'm going to see that my short neck flexors turn off and that my traps get stiff and pissed at the end of the day and I may get headaches, mm-hmm. right? I mean, my, my jaw may not function well, et cetera, et cetera. The key to here is understanding that you know, we understand that changing behaviors, you know, in the in the brain are difficult, right? It's difficult to change a pattern. It's difficult to change a behavior. Everyone will agree with that. Hey, I want you to stop smoking or I want you to stop, you know, saying the word um when we talk. It's very difficult to change these patterns. And that's because our consciousness, right, that conscious behavior in our brain or, or thought patterns are laid down in a way that when a certain behavior happens or a certain process in our brain, that process gets happens a lot, gets reinforced through a concept called myelination. Okay. So physically in the brain, a neural pathway that's constantly leaned on, the body is fast, smart enough to say, hey, we can reinforce that and make that a more efficient pattern by laying myelin and greater insulation around those those neurons. We can group those neurons together. And so we say that neurons that fire together, wire together, and we start to see super highways of, of patterns, sort of like a shortcut. Okay. Well, that's great. And that, okay, that's why it's really difficult to change patterns and change, change you know, habits. Well, it turns out that beh- physical behavior, movement, is just a manifestation of a brain pattern. And so practice, we know, doesn't make perfect. Practice makes permanent. And so how I move and how I default and how I spend most of my time, my brain begins to think, well, this is who we are. This is how it goes. This is how we reinforce. And it may not be using the whole, you know, I have a living room, but my brain's like, ah, we only live in this little corner and that corner is good. So we'll just reinforce that corner. And so what we need to understand, though, is if my head position, I'm always looking down then, and I'm always sitting slouched. That will be my default when I'm stressed. That will be my default when I run. That will be the place I go to when I fatigue because that's the place where it costs the least to be myself. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's a good explanation. Okay. And, and it's important to understand that you should not fear looking down. But if you spend two to four hours hunched over and looking down, guarantee you you're going to be a little bit stiffer mm-hmm. will your neck fall off no but you may have a hard time putting your arms over your head and when your jaw clicks and you grind your teeth at night we can start to ask what is going on there yeah. you know what, let's be curious about that and it's interesting because even the word posture which has sort of been co-opted by you know you know we we have posture is the the latin root, root of posture is position and what it's, what it's really saying is posture is the position of your spine and one of the things that we tend to, to lean on is a concept called scalability. So I can walk with my feet turned out like a duck. Mm-hmm. It's no problem. I just, my, it's just fine. And I may or may not have to have bunion surgery eventually, right? And I may, not, may or not have an ankle impingement. I may or may not have knee pain. Right. But I can tell you that that foot walking turned out position causes my hips not to function as well. And that if I run like a duck, I'm going to be slow. And if I cut and have to change direction with my feet turned out like a duck, that's a recipe for lost position, lost, lost mechanics. It's not, it's not ideal. So what we can say is, hey, maybe that position, while it works, is not our best position. And we can say the same thing about the spine, that you know, if I'm running, what I'm really doing is performing a bunch of little jumps 
while I displace my center of mass forward. So I'm leaning forward and just basically falling and then putting my foot underneath my center of mass, right? Pushing, pulling, whatever the language you're using. Okay. Well, it turns out that the spine handles that vertical oscillation axially from the head down really efficiently. And if I suddenly round my upper back and put my head forward, now my spine has to support the head in a weird and strange way. So it may not be a problem for you to round your back and walk around, but it's suddenly jumping or serving or swimming or running, and that becomes a problem. Does that make sense? Yeah, that and makes And so what we sense. like to say is, well, hey, you know, I understand that that may or may not cause pain and dysfunction, mm-hmm. but what I can tell you is that as soon as we get into this Pilates class or yoga class or any of our movement traditions, martial arts or Olympic lifting or powerlifting, mm-hmm. we're going to have to have a conversation about your crappy body position. Yeah, yeah. And that's one of the main issues with people that are doing deadlifts and, and all of these mechanical lifts where they have to have good, good form and function. I wanted to ask you about, um, about the idea, because I have a standing desk here, and I've had it for a few years. And it's interesting that this just sort of happened. It wasn't like a New Year's resolution. Somewhere around the beginning of this year, I just decided I'm, I'm not making sitting down an option because the kind of standing desk I have is like a... It's like a crank, and so it takes a little mm. bit of effort to you know pull it up and down. And so what I was doing was I would sit for like I would sit for maybe the fir- like I break the day up into thirds, and so I, I would I would um, stand, and then I would take a middle of the part of the day for three or four hours, and that would be my sitting time. But during that sitting time, I would sit, and every fifteen minutes, I'd get up and, and do a little stretch. But then over time, what I realized what I was doing is I was just getting lazy, so I would just you know, all of a sudden the second whole second half of my day would be sitting instead of broken up in two. And so I was often thinking, is it still damaging to sit for so long if you're breaking it up every 15 minutes? Well, let's, let's, let's back up and unpackage a couple of things there. One is that it's not a standing desk. Standing still is also a problem. Okay. Yes, I bring more calories, but once again, I'm not moving. And there's a whole host of dysfunction. If you've ever worked a factory job where you cannot move left or right one foot, then you're going to understand how gruesome that reality is, right? right. You're going to have to have an anti-fatigue mat. And what's that anti-fatigue mat doing underneath your feet? It allows you to change positions because it's soft enough that it's kind of squishy, mm-hmm. right? That's, that's what that's working. Mm-hmm. So the first thing we should say is it's not a standing desk. It's a moving desk. Okay. It's a movement-based desk. And that when I'm up, I have more movement options. I can fidget. I can, you know, I can put my foot up on something like I'm drinking at the pub. Okay. Right? I can perch against a stool. And suddenly it's a lot easier for me to have a lot to maintain the integrity of my spine and breathing mechanics and head mechanics orientation. So it costs less. I'm going to see less dysfunction. But also it gives me a lot more movement options. Interesting. The second thing is we don't want to look at sitting as damaging. We want to look at the sitting as not as efficient or not as functionally good as moving in a better position. I have to work a lot harder. Mm -hmm. And what you just found was, the most important part is moving more. And so there was a great study that showed a big office worker, and they compared the smokers to the non-smokers. And guess who was more healthy in that group? Well, you just got to go with the non-smokers on that one. You wish, but it was the smokers. And the reason is that the smokers, every 30 minutes, had to get up and walk to the smoking section and have a smoke and walk back. Wow. And everyone else just sat around. And it turns out that the smokers, in spite of smoking, were moving more, and that had a bigger impact on their overall health, which is not what I'm advocating for. But maybe a fake smoking habit is the way, right? Ah, I just picked up smoking because now I get to go outside and, and hang out for a few minutes. But the real issue here is, when I do find myself in a situation where I'm sitting, then every 15 or 20 minutes, get up for a couple minutes and move around. And then now we've got a solution to the reality that the world is set up for us to sit. But I've now just introduced what we call a sort of a decision where I have to, you know, I get decision fatigue or I'm, I'm, I'm hustling and and, and what ends up happening is that, of course, unless I have you know, iron discipline, I'm less likely to get up every 15 to 20 minutes. There's a local company called Chevron, and they've done a really innovative thing. And they lock the computers for the entire company every 55 minutes. Oh, wow. They lock it for five minutes. And guess what happens when you lock your computer every 55 minutes? You have to stand up and walk around. And if you 
ignore that warning and keep working, your boss gets a, a ping that you ignored it and they are responsible for you to move around. And so they get dinged if you keep, you know, they're going to come over and be like, bro, you need to stand up and walk around. <laughs> Wow. And what happens was we saw big changes in culture. So they took the option away. Hey, you've got to move more. We're going to create a culture that supports that. And then people were talking and taking a break. You know, they're moving a little bit more. And uh, you know, one of our friends is a guy named Jim Lesser, who is the CEO, kind of head of a big marketing firm here in San Francisco called BBDO. Mm-hmm. And all of his workers have options to be at a movement movement desk. Okay. And one of the things that they have, and of course you can sit down, right? We give people movement options: sit down, stand up. You know, movement rich environment is really our goal. Mm-hmm. And he has a, a company policy, which is they call it walk, call, and click. So if you need to talk to someone. The first thing you need to do is get up and go to the desk. Go see them. Then you call them. Then you email them. And so that gets rid of all the email. It gets rid of lazy communication. It gets people face-to-face. And built into that is a lot more movement. So one of the things that you noticed about yourself is that, hey, I tended to get lazy because I had the option of going up and down. Yeah. As it started to come in, you know, towards the time, I just was like, well, I came back from lunch and my desk was already down. Yeah. So what we recommend for people who have high low desks or dynamic desks is to throw away the key, make it high, take the crank out, put the crank in the other room. So if you need to sit down, you're going to have to go get up, walk, go get the crank and put it down, right? And uh, otherwise, what we see is that we'll default because we are occupied with other things. And so what we try to do is we try to block behavior. We try to take away people's choices around making bad decisions. And this people can relate to. So if there's fruit in the in the guest break room, guess what people are going to eat for snack? Fruit. Mm-hmm. If I put donuts out, guess what people are going to eat? Donuts. Mm-hmm. I mean, <laughs> if I have ice cream and cookies in the house, I guarantee you I'm eating ice cream and cookies tonight. Guarantee yeah. <laughs> you. So it's easier for me not to have ice cream and cookies in the house. Right. And I, I think this is what we want people to understand about their movement environment is that if you give yourself lots of good choices, I'm going to, hey, I need to sit down, I'm going to sit on my bar stool, I'm going to perch, then it becomes very easy to make the right decision or make a better decision that supports my physiology than having to say, oh, I need to stand up every 15 minutes. Yeah. You know, it's cool too because um, I've done what you did. I don't know what it was. It was something, you know how every now and then you just, something snaps in your brain and you just decide, okay, this is it. I'm not going to eat this kind of food anymore. I don't know. I'm just changing. Yeah. And um, and so around the beginning of the year, I just did that. I said, all right, I'm not sitting anymore. I'm just not going to do it. Because I had been sitting and falling into these bad patterns and working long hours and stuff like that. And so what's cool now is that I used to, you know, when the phone would ring, I would stand and take the phone call standing because I was sitting. But now every time the phone rings and I'm talking on the phone, what I'll do is I'll, I'll sit or I'll stretch while, you know, give my feet a bit of a break. And so now the majority of the time is sitting, I'm sorry, standing, but then I'll use these little breaks. I got to every, you know, 30 minutes or something, I have to stretch or do something with my feet. And I got a little, um, a little lacrosse ball that I, I rub on the bottom of my feet to make it more, um, you know, easily able to do that. But I'm finding now I'm standing all the time and I'm just looking for little instances throughout the day to sit or stretch to give myself a little break and then I'll go back to standing and I'm good. Well, I think that's, you've, you've nailed it, you know, and, and that we look at, you know, sitting is like a treat, you know, Hey, I get to take a load off. It feels fantastic. Oh, sitting down is amazing. amazing. Oh man. So my so kids, for example, um, our daughters, we have one daughter who has never been at a desk at her elementary school. She's now in the third grade. Oh wow! And we, my daughters, uh, our local elementary school became the first, all movement desk based elementary school in the world. We don't have any we don't have any traditional desks, any sedentary desks at our school. And uh, this happened a couple years ago. Wow. And what I'll tell you is that um, the desks are all individually sized for the children. We just went in and readjusted desks on Monday oh, wow. and or on Tuesday. And literally, here's how you can at home find out if your desk is high enough. You're gonna flip your hands up, hang them by your side, so let your hands hang by your side. Forearms are parallel to the ground. Measure from your elbow to the ground, then go up one inch. That's how high your standing station should be. And what we're seeing is that we're making the assumption that everyone's moving desk or movement desk is the right height for them. And guess what? It is not. 
Hmm. You know, most of the time it's too low. And so you end up bent over the counter. You're working too low. You're, you're in a, you, once again, you try to do the right thing, but you know, you're eating health cookies. <laughs> you know what I mean? The idea here is that's a paleo <laughs> brownie. Right. And it's not, it's not whole food. So let's make sure that the desk actually fits you. So all of these desks, the kids now, these movement desks, they all support them. They get to lean against them. You know, their hips are against them. They're supported at the, at the correct height for the arm. And they also have a, f- a swing bar. So the kids are in constant motion. Oh, wow. There's a fidget bar on the bottom, a bar that swings so they can be in constant motion. And when you put your foot up on a bar or a box, you basically take some of the extension load out of your spine, which makes it a lot easier to stand. So what we tell people is it's not a standing station until you have a place to also put your foot, just like the Captain Morgan pose. And that's why the Captain Morgan pose is the Captain Morgan pose because that guy has a bad back and allows him to get out of extension when the, when the foot is up, and which is why every pub on the world is all at bar height, not desk height, and everything, every pub or bar has a rail at the bottom that you put your foot on because the bartenders figured out that if we made it the right height and gave you a place to foot your foot, you could drink all day long. Oh, my gosh. See, they're smart, aren't they? Yeah, well, yeah. When it, when, again, <laughs> when it comes down to productivity, we start to pay attention. So what's interesting about all of the research coming out around movement more is that you can take anything that you care about, whether it's productivity, whether it's engagement, whether it's calories burned, whether it's, I mean, choose something that you care about and it turns out that you will see an improvement when we respect the physiology of the human. And that's, and that's really, it should be that simple. You know, we're seeing that, you know, test scores go up. There was a, a good study that was published in the last six months that showed a call center that had a, when they made a sale, that was a one. When they didn't make a sale on a call, that was a zero. So they're able to track productivity very easily uh-huh. in this binary way. And it turns out that they basically saw a $40 million increase in sales, a 50% increase in productivity when people were at movement desks because their brains worked a little better. They were more engaged. Oh and I, I think that shouldn't surprise us, whether it's ADD or ADHD or movement disorders. You know, All of these things come back to the fact that our brains work best when we are supported in movement. Mm-hmm. And what we try to do with our kids, for example, at the school, is anytime they want to take a break, they sit on the floor, which is totally fine. And it turns out that we actually have structures and, and positions that support our spines more effectively. And when we sit on the floor, we're taking our hips through full range of motion. And now we fall into this other weird category of like looking around and seeing, you know, what are these other sort of data sets? What are we other seeing experiences? In cultures that toilet on the ground and sleep on the ground, Mm -hmm. fall risk in the elderly drops to almost zero. Oh, really? They don't fall. Why? Because they're constantly getting up and down off the ground to sleep and to pee, and to pee, right? Hip disease, lumbar disease starts to fall to zero in, in cultures that toilet on the ground and sleep on the ground. Wow. And what you're seeing is the number one reason most of us will end up in a nursing home is we can't get up and down off the ground. In fact, there was a really good study that came out not so long ago that correlated your ability to get up and down off the ground without using your hands or without using getting into a high kneel with early mortality. And you can go on and, and take a look at that. And all you have to do is observe someone getting up off and down off the ground. And for every point of contact – Every knee, every high, every that you need to get up and down off the ground, you're more likely to die early. Why? Because it's an excellent indicator of range of motion, excellent indicator of hip function, right, and strength and core trunk mm-hmm. musculature. Yeah, no, I've heard about that. The points of pressure, and some people can get up off the ground with just one leg. You know, they can really balance, and and they've got strong legs, strong ankles, strong thighs, and all of that. And uh, use it or lose it. And yeah. you know what's easy to do. Get up and down off the ground. So yeah. my mother comes and works at my mother in law works at our works out at our gym. Oh nice. And um they were you know, we have a master's class and so we have about ten, you know, athletes in their sixties and seventies uh-huh. who come. And uh the they did floor press yesterday, right? So they're basically bench pressing, they're doing floor press. And because uh, there's a lot of good correlation between pushing strength and you know, and function and everyone needs to be able to push. But because it's floor press Every single time, every single set, they have to get up and down off the ground. And a couple of them really struggle to get up and down off the ground. And we end up having a conversation about strategies to improve getting up and down off the ground. And they were like, this is the best class I've ever had. I just got up and down off the ground 30 times. And I was like, well, <laughs> welcome to being a human being. 
Yeah, I know it's uh, and there's also another exercise. You probably know what it is. It's um it's I think if you sit at on the end of your chair and if you put your feet out in front of you and you sit about, you know, um if your feet are about shoulder width apart and you sit on the end of your chair, your ability to to stand up, straighten up and sit down, straighten up, sit down. There's some amount of um I forget what the study was, but it's like it, it you know your ability to do that is directly correlated with your health, your cardiovascular health, and all of that too. Yeah, and what, what we're what we're starting to sway into now is finally, I think we're getting to the place where we can have some movement vital signs. And you know what 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 we have done for a long time, especially from the the Western medicine side, which is largely reactive. You know, if you go see a physical therapist for shoulder pain, the physical therapist. Will will often say in the notes, for example, you're within normal limits or it's functional, which means you can feed yourself and do your bra, right? You can get up and down the toilet, right? But that's not full capacity, and I'm not talking about super normal gymnast level stuff, right? Jean Claude Van Damme between two trucks. I'm talking about the normal range of motion we all should have and are able to maintain. Uh-huh. And I think it's important for us to understand that, you know, we all like what is what is what do we say is functional blood pressure? 120 over 80. Right. Like that's that doesn't mean that's great. That just means it's functional, right? That's that's not a red flag. But we don't have the equivalence in movement capacity. We don't have the equivalence in cardiovascular capacity. We're starting to see that cardiovascular capacity, VO2 max, is an excellent indicator of mortality and excellent indicator of vitality. But you know, how fast can you walk a mile? You know, carrying something. I mean, you know, we we haven't really established those lines in the sand. Mm. You know, for example, you should be able to squat with your feet together all the way down to the ground without your heels coming up off the ground. It's one or zero, yes or no. Why? Because that's expression of basic normal range of motion of the ankle and basic range of motion of the hip. I mean, just I think it was the Washington Post or HuffPo recently just put out an article where they were seeing a radical increase in hip dysfunction in sort of millennial athletes coming into physical therapists and doctors because you know they're they're seeing all this impingement and torn labrums as they engage in all this high intensity exercise. Wow. And of course what it turns out is we should be able to exercise like that, but we don't have the requisite range of motion to exercise like that. It's like, you know, hey, I'm gonna go race my car, but I'm only gonna stay in third gear and the handbrake is on a little bit. Right. I can do it. It's not gonna be great. And so subsequently I think we have done a poor job of explaining to people these are the baselines of movement function, and here's what you should be able to do. And if you can't, don't panic. You just have to work on it. A little you can bit. work on it. Yeah, yeah. That's one of the things I do um, almost every single time. Well, just about every single time we, if we watch a movie on Netflix or something like that, I'll bring my lacrosse ball. I just sit on the ground and I'll do a series of massage on the cross on the, on the lacrosse ball as well as. Uh, doing some stretching, and then by the time you know, I, I can only really watch like an hour of something before I just start losing it. I got to go do something else. I can't. I can't. I don't know. I just don't like being you know sedentary for that long. But what I'll do is I'll just stretch and I'll do the lacrosse ball the entire time, and and then if if anything, I'll lay down uh, for a few minutes at that time. But I, I've just stopped using the couch altogether, just like you. I just I just don't do it anymore. Well, I love my mid-century modern couch, and it's not going away. But I will tell you, you're <laughs> absolutely right. It's that that time can be used. And one of the things that we we really strive to do is show people that we can actually simplify their lives. One of the best ways to improve your sleeping quality is to do 10 minutes of soft tissue mobilization, roll on a lacrosse ball, roll on a roller, roll on something before you go to bed. It has a large parasympathetic kick on your body that when you do that – soft tissue work you're telling your nervous system it's everything is cool here and you'll actually sleep better oh, wow. and what we find is that that you know the 10 minutes before you move to the bedroom is really poorly used time people are on their internet they're watching tv they're hanging out so you, that's a perfect chance to work on some of these these things like some basic soft tissue work and you know suddenly now you're doing a little preventative maintenance every day you know you're you're addressing what's tight and, you know, I suspect that if we all moved really well and we're in a really movement-rich environment, we wouldn't need to roll out as much, you mm-hmm. know. But if you sit six to eight, ten hours a day, your hips are going to become short and your musculature and your quads are going to become stiff. Yeah. And then when you wear a hole in your kneecap because your heel striking, because your hips are short, don't be surprised that that happened because that was just a normal expression of the system. 
And more importantly is that when we get people you know, into being able to simplify these processes, you don't have to do hours and hours of maintenance. Ten minutes before you go to bed is all it's going to take. Aggregated seven days a week, you know, that's many, many years of ten minutes a day. And, you know, you're, you're going to be shocked at how much better you can feel. Definitely adds up. Hey, what are your thoughts about, you know, when we're doing this show right now, like I said, I'm on a standing desk and I'm moving a lot and stuff, but when I'm standing and working, I'm typing and I can't put my leg up on the table or I can't do these types of movements when I'm actually working. Um, what are your I, thoughts? I, about- I would disagree. I think you can, you know, and if you look at Deskbound, we give you many pages of options of changing your position around a, a bar stool. Okay. Okay. Well, that right? sounds cool. You can cool, squat yeah. in the chair. You can lay your leg across. You can pigeon. You can. I mean, there's so much you can do to be changing your position, even fidgeting side to side, left foot up, right foot up. How how can you create a movement lexicon, right? A vocabulary of positions that you can kind of constantly move in and out of. Yeah, I like what you're, you know, what you're saying about the desk because it's not a standing desk, but it's a movement desk. It's an opportunity to move, or I guess you have more opportunity to move what are your thoughts about like um putting a little treadmill underneath the desk well it's interesting you know i think we one of the things that i said earlier we asked do do things scale right Uh is this is this valid and scalable and i think one of my problems with the treadmill desk is it doesn't scale i'm not going to get a whole corporation to buy in to buy five thousand dollar treadmills for everyone you know and i I don't think i don't think we need to i think if you want to have a treadmill desk you should knock yourself out if you want a swimming treadmill desk go for it <laughs> if you if you want a squat to press desk knock yourself out but the idea is you know i think we don't need that and for more importantly for me it doesn't scale it's a really expensive solution to a problem that doesn't require it you know i just yeah. need to move more you know we you know th- people are selling really really expensive chairs that allow us to optimize our sitting position and if it's a you know fifteen hundred dollar chair that's great but you know a lot. I have uh, I have 500 elementary school kids who are all sitting down. So you're gonna buy them a 1500 dollars chair? I don't think so. Yeah, yeah. You know, so so for us, we just say, hey, maybe that's not as valuable a solution. And you know, I'm the whole time I've been talking with you, I'm standing at my counter, mm-hmm. I'm fidgeting back and forth. I've been laying one of my legs on the counter doing pigeon pose. I love so that. So playing the pigeon game back and forth. And you know, I've made a choice by just immediately dividing my day into sitting that's optional and sitting that's not optional. Mm. And during this call, I had a choice between optional sitting and non-optional sitting, and I'm taking advantage of the fact that I don't have to sit. But after I get off this call, I'm going to go jump in the car, and that's that's non-optional sitting. So what I'm doing is thinking, hey, I can just sort of preload right, and make these decisions about uh, about low side of control, and uh, here's the allegory. <laughs> Sometimes, and you might relate to this because you know a lot of nerdy athletes do this. But um, when we go to like Christmas parties and holiday parties, you show up and you know it's going to be like cheese dip and bread and. And you know stuff that I eat sometimes, but stuff that I don't want to eat necessarily. Right, right. And sometimes there's not a good protein source at these things. So what I got into the habit of doing was preloading a little protein before. You know, I'd eat like a handful of turkey before I went to a party. Right. Oh right, right. And um, my wife would actually she calls the phenomenon pork cheeks because one time I was in the elevator. You know, we were visiting her her mother, and I was holding my baby daughter and like a and a like a stroller or something. Or you know. And I had huge mouthfuls of pork tenderloin <laughs> from the night before. And she's like, what, what is wrong with you? And I was, she's like, you're like a chipmunk hoarding pork. And I was like, we're going to a party. I can't control how much pork is in there. So let me just control what I can control right now, which is stuffing my mouth full of pork. Nice. So, so the pork cheek <laughs> phenomenon is, hey, I know I'm going to have to sit later on on my commute home. Mm-hmm. So right now I'm choosing not to sit. I'm choosing to basically stuff my cheeks with pork as I talk to you. And that's allegory for standing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know what's really helped me a lot is this lacrosse ball. I tell you, because my, you know, when I first did it, um, first started standing as a regular discipline and just doing it every day and having no other option, uh, my feet were just killing me. And I think it's, yeah. you know, and so I just massage my, I have one of those little um, anti fatigue mats things and I, and I do the lacrosse ball and I just switch back and forth and it's helping me a lot. Do you think those are good for that? Well, it's funny, but most people don't realize that the, the popularity of the crossball started with Mobility Watt. That's us. We, oh, really? Um, in 2007, I had a patient in the, in the clinic you know, uh, who was, you know, I was using these little pinky balls, tennis balls. He's like, dude, have you tried a lacrosse ball? And I was like, 
uh, whoa, whoa, this is amazing. Oh, it's and so, we so started great. putting that out. And, uh, you know, now I get, you know, emails from bulk emails from lacrosse ball manufacturers saying, you know, the lacrosse ball has been the choice of the mobilization professional for a long time. And I'm like, <laughs> no, it's not. That's that's recent. Yeah. But what, what's important about the lacrosse ball is that it's so ubiquitous and so inexpensive. We've just suddenly democratized it. You know, they cost a buck or so online. And, you know, and, and if they disappear, no one gets, you know, their panties in a twist. You know, it's, right. you know, like, you know, like people at our gym, they take our lacrosse balls and, you know, some of our staff are like, they took a lacrosse ball. I'm like, they're dealing with their crap at home on their own. Yes, they can take as many lacrosse balls as they want. And, you know, it's so cheap and you can kind of keep them seated around your house. Right. But, you know, what what's important, though, is that the lacrosse ball is sort of a gateway drug tool to, you know, more sophisticated tools that you can, you know, the lacrosse ball is too round, it's too square, it's too hard, it's too soft, it's too big, it's too small. And suddenly you have a few implements that, you know, all kind of work differently. And you'll, you'll find that, you know, different tools for different things. If the lacrosse ball is a hammer, and you can certainly get a lot done with a hammer, but it's not the perfect tool. Yeah. You know, it's but really... It's just really cool to think that, like, you know, if you're going to stand and sort of make that commitment like I have, and then you start looking for ways to make that possible, you know, and so you start thinking, okay, I can get an anti-fatigue mat, you know, those little mats on the ground, I can get a little crossbow, I can move every every 15 minutes, I can get up and do some stretching, so I'm not getting just standing in one position, I could do all these things to facilitate being able to make that time, because now I've I've gone, let's see, what is it now, what's the day today, it's like the... 20th day so it might be like maybe 18 days i haven't sat in a chair to work and my feet still hurt but i'm, I'm getting through it <laughs> well you know what you're seeing is that you're hurting because you suck yeah you're not you're you had trained your body not to do this so and this is important that moving and standing is our birthright as human beings this is what we're supposed to do mm. well what happened to us that suddenly my feet hurt when I stand for 20 minutes, like red flag. Yeah, right. And what we're realizing is we're sort of digging our way out and renormalizing our tissues. And that, that takes some time. We recommend that people put themselves on a shaping gradient. You know, look at moving to a movement-based workday as training for a marathon. You wouldn't go out and run 26 miles today if we were going to train for a marathon. So let's do this. Make a commitment today to try to stand and move for 20 minutes during your day. And keep that 20-minute goal for a week or so. Maybe keep, keep it for two weeks. And then guess what we're going to do after two weeks? We're going to go to 30 minutes a day. And pretty soon you're going to be like, oh, I got this. This is no problem. My feet don't ache. No big deal. right? And then after a month, you're standing an hour a day, standing two hours a day, and, or moving two hours a day. And what's happened is you've just put a whole bunch more movement in. And pretty soon it's not a big deal to be on your feet and moving all day long. It's, just not, a, it's not a big deal. And I, I think the problem is we go all in. And the desk doesn't fit us, and we are on a hard surface instead of you know an environment that's sort of conducive. And what you're really doing with an anti fatigue mat is you're simulating movement, right? You're coming back to that idea, mm. you know. You're simulating uneven surfaces on the ground, which is which is what you know as you p move and shift, you're changing your fascial loads, you're changing your muscular loads, you're you're releasing the static holds on your feet, and now you're pumping fresh blood back back in and moving fluids, in, and that's called movement, right? Mm. That's what we should be doing. So, yeah, you know, understand that all of this is really just surrogate for how would we be in the real world? Well, we we wouldn't ever just sit down and if we sat down, we'd squat or we'd sit on the ground, and even then, we'd, we'd get up and moving constantly. And that's that's really the idea here is to think about plugging in more movement richness, and then when you do have to sit. There's some techniques around that, and we, we write a ton about that on the book, about how to optimize your sitting and seated life so that you know, you're making fewer body compromises in that situation when that, when that comes up. Yeah, and it's, it's interesting, too, with, with the standing desk or with, with the movement desk, like, it's, like you said, it's much easier to, for me at least, to, to realize, like, okay, I'm, I'm, you know, my posture is not good or I'm leaning forward a little bit, or, but in a... When I'm sitting, I just, I don't have that awareness. Like, you know, after a couple hours, I'll realize I'm doing it. Whereas when I'm standing, I realize it almost right away. It's crazy. Well, yeah. And, you know, because, you know, the impact of gravity in that through your feet, you're going to get some feedback that, you know, you're in a bad position and need to fidget. And remember, every time you have a fidget need, that's your body saying, I need you to change positions. Mm. But what we've done is we've literally figured out how to override that. 
So when little boys sit, there's a great book called Raising Cain, which looks at the educational differences between boys and girls. And boys are getting their butts kicked at school right now. And, and basically everything, graduation rates, gra- grad school, professional school. And largely we think that boys have a larger genetic drive to move than girls. Girls have to move too, of course. I have two daughters. They're you know fidgety little monsters. But um, the idea here is that um, we are seeing that boys get in trouble for fidgeting at school, even though, and it's literally their genetics and body saying, "I need you to move now. I wow. need you have to move." Then they, you know, go into any classroom. Show me a posture that your grandma would be in a traditional sitting, you know, classroom. Go in and show me, you know, again, spinal shapes that your grandma wouldn't vomit at. And you're gonna, you know, and you're gonna see that they all are bent over little rainbows. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know, and, and the question is, when we sit down. We basically start, you know, carving off s- systems of stability, like our glutes, like our hips. Those things go out, and so I'm left with just very few mechanisms to support myself, right. and that's why I end up defaulting looking. So anytime you find yourself kind of pitched on one leg, or you're overextended, or you're doing some kind of slouchy thing, what you're looking for is you're you're doing what we call tension hunting, is that you're looking for stability instead of creating that stability organically through your feet. That's crazy. Look, okay. here's, here's a good idea. Pelvic floor dysfunction, you know, if you're an athlete or a woman who, who has, you know, bladder incontinence, you know, this is a real problem. And what we've, what we've literally, we had uh, a company send us maxi pads like things for women athletes, and it was called Go Girl. And mm-hmm. so that someone thought it was cute to say, hey, look, it's totally normal for women to pee themselves when they exercise. And we're saying, no, it's not. And part of the reason we see so much pelvic floor dysfunction is that we're not adequately weight-bearing through the hips. That endopelvic fascia, it's the only way it can actually truly be activated and truly be wound up and supported so I don't have create a dystonic pelvic floor is to weight-bear through the hips. That's a crucial aspect of reestablishing the relationship between the lumbar and the pelvis, which helps to my pelvic floor to function. That's, that's how we resolve pelvic floor dysfunction. We re- reestablish normal relationships that would happen in standing mm-hmm. and they're dysfunctional in sitting and we get people weight bearing again. And then we can start to solve this, this, you know, bladder dysfunction. And, and it's crucial to understand that our bodies are miraculous at short circuiting our normal circuits so we can go on. Like we can just hack our way out of almost any problem. Mm-hmm. But you, once again, the real idea here is, what are we supposed to do as humans? Are we supposed to wear high heel shoes all the time? Uh uh uh. Are we supposed to be on perfectly flat surfaces all the time? No, we're not. And you know, for example, one of the one of my favorite you know simulacrums is a company called Ergo Driven, and we have no association with them other than they're they're good kids and they make something that's awesome. Mm-hmm. But it's a mat that looks like a, a Klingon spaceship on the outside, so it kind of has a ring mm-hmm. and has a dome in the middle, and it's basically a anti fatigue mat. It has all of this curiosity and angulation built into your feet. So you can stand on one surface and you can tilt your feet and it naturally creates sort of movement variability. And that's really the goal. How do we create movement richness from our feet up? Yeah, we're supposed to be moving all day long, right? We're not supposed to be yeah. even standing or doing anything sedentary at all for you know such long periods of time. It's just – it's uh. It's crazy. It's crazy. My how wife, our my, my wife, and I have this ongoing battle, and you know, and, and uh, you know, Juliet usually wins, but uh, you know, she's from SoCal, <laughs> and uh, you know, the mall and parking is a thing, and uh, oh yeah, whenever we park in the uh, we go shopping, I park as far away from the door as I can, so I just forced to walk more. Yeah, and she's always like, "We could get closer," you know, you didn't, you know, and we have this sort of ongoing battle, but I just program that in so that I have to do a little bit more walking, you know? Yeah, yeah, it's it's. I think it's, um, like you've said, if we take care of ourselves and we do things on a daily basis where you, where we don't get stuck in these ruts and we don't, we don't do things in a sedentary way for long periods of time every single day, if you're moving all day long, I mean, for me, I mean, I, I personally, I love to work out and I love having dedicated days where I go in my backyard and do my workout outside and I love all that, but I mean, even if people, if they never were a gym person and didn't take care of themselves, even mm. if they just fixed this area of their life up, they would be, you know, they would see huge benefits. Well, you know, I work in elite athletics. I mean, from the elite military groups to, you know, I probably talk to four or five professional teams 
this week alone, plus universe. I mean, we just see a lot of high performance. Uh-huh. But if you pin me down, I'm going to be like, eh, the thing you should probably do is walk more. You know, that, that's it. Don't sit, walk more. Right? Sleep, don't sit, walk more. So easy. And, um, you know, one of the things that, you know, we l- try to get people to understand is your physical practice, the thing that you're doing to support your, your physiology so you can live to be 110 and, and not be in pain is you need to move more, but that's a physical practice that's a 24-hour physical practice. Right. Including, am I drinking water? Am I managing stress? Do I sleep enough? And one of those pieces is moving more. And, um, you know, my wife and I, one of the things that we do and recognize is that we're like busy people, and some, sometimes the day gets away from us. Woo! And I'm like, ah, we'd love to have trained really hard today because we love to train. My wife is a world champion. I paddle on the national team. We are, we, are, we are nerds for exercise. I have high genetic drive to, to move and train. But some days I don't get to because my day gets away from me and I have a family and businesses. And, but my wife and I walk our daughter to school every day. And it's about a mile and a quarter. Oh, nice. And we used to walk both our daughters, but now just one daughter. And um, that means by the time we're back, it's 8.10 in the morning. We're already back by 8.10. So we can jump in the car and roll. And we've already walked a 5K, basically. And, you know, almost a 5K. We walked about four kilometers or so. And no matter what happens the rest of the day, I have already walked four kilometers, you know, which is for Juliet, it ends up being about six, 7,000 of her 10,000 steps oh, wow. already. And so because that's in the morning, I can control that. I now have put in a whole lot of movement into the day that I don't have to worry about later on. So one of the nice things is that if I am programmed my environment – to be more movement rich, then if I don't go to the gym, I'm still covered because I've done a lot more movement. So it's not so desperate to need to get there, right? My body still had load. I've still been active, right? And the second thing that happens is that when I leave my work self, when I leave my family self, I'm better set up and better prepared to go leverage my time to go ride my bike, go stand up paddle, go outrigger, ski, right? Whatever it is that I do that allows me, I don't have to sort of, you know, be in these bad positions and stretch 30 minutes so I can go around. I don't have to do that. I'm already sort of warmed up and my body's ready to go have this experience. Yeah, it's good stuff. Good stuff. I love it. I'm a big fan of it and I'm just starting to see the results myself after having been doing it probably 18, 19 days. Um, check, check this out. My wife is a great case study. Uh-huh. So Juliet is a typical, you know, former world champion, 43 year old woman, couple kids, right? CEO. Uh-huh. Turns out that when she stands during work, when it moves during work, doesn't sit, she moves from sedentary to movement, she burns an additional 100,000 calories a year, 100,000 calories. She, wow. she could run 33 marathons or she could move more during her work day. And I don't know about you, but I weigh 235 and I'm pretty lean. And what I'll tell you is that 100,000 calories, and that's for me, it would be way more than that. Do you know how much ice cream 100,000 calories is? Jeez, I don't know. If I put 100,000 calories of ice cream on the table, you'd be like, no way. And I'm like, yep, that's a freebie. You know why that's a freebie? Because (laughs) I just spent that ice cream moving at work. And so that means that I have a little bit more slop in my diet right? options. Not that I recommend eating 100,000 calories of ice cream a day, a year. But understand that it's a significant metabolic cost. To move more, and that's fantastic. Wow, that is so amazing. And you know what the cool thing too is now I'm getting to the point where um, I'm starting to see all these benefits. And so, you know, I don't even want to sit anymore. It's not even a desire for me to sit. I mean, I, I mean, I love sitting in the t- in the sense that it's a nice little break for a couple minutes if I go get a snack during the day, um, during my workday. But it's not something where like I would come back into the room and intentionally lower my desk knowing that I would sit for three or four hours. I just, not only do I know what it does to me, but I also don't want to re- deny myself the benefits of, of standing. And so it's, well, if, it's it great. It feels better, right? And, yeah. You know, I think, I think you're really, what ultimately we're talking about is a, a change in consciousness. And that when you start to become conscious and aware of, really listen to your body and we sort of get off this stimulant depressant cycle. I have four bulletproof coffees in the morning, two glasses of wine to go to bed and yeah. ambient, and right? We start to listen more. Hey, I'm exhausted. It's nine o'clock and I'm really tired. You know, that's what we should be doing. And on those days where you're smoked, sit down at work, you know, yeah. take a little break every once in a while. You're sick, lean up against your stool. And what you'll actually be able to hear the difference of when your body is saying, hey, look, 
you know, I need to pull all the resources in. And when you start listening then, and when you sit, you know, you get off the airplane, you're going to be like, oh, I feel wretched. And that's because now you resensitize yourself to the desire to need to move. Yeah, I know. It's, um, it's a, you know, each person has their own little journey of how they're going to get into it. And, you know, sometimes it might take a long time of easing into it. For me, I kind of eased into it, but then I, at the very end, I just sort of jumped right into it, you know, but, uh, well, you know, you don't have to believe in your human physiology. It believes in you, uh-huh. you know? And so it's, you know, this is all about personal choice and, you know, don't take our word for it. Experiment, you know, be playing around with it because I think you'll be shocked at that, um, you know, your hips aren't, your back doesn't hurt as much your you know, your feet are a little springy, your, your 5k times decrease. I mean, whatever it is that you, know, you want to look better naked, Yeah. whatever is important to you, I, I bet you can turn that around somehow. Hey, what kind of stuff do you have going on on mobilitywide.com? What's, uh, what's there for people? And I see you have a bunch of courses. What's, what are those about? Well, you know, we have, uh, we've been teaching a course for about eight years to coaches and people about how to, you know, uh, movement theory and about how to restore your movement theory through mobilizations and soft tissue work. Um, how to resolve old injuries and old kind of musculoskeletal movement based problems. But one of the things that we do on MobilityWild that's really fun is we do a daily follow along video that takes about 10 or 15 minutes. So you don't have to worry about what to do. You can push play. It's like having a yoga teacher in your living room. We have a part of it that's like, this is, this is what you're going to do at home. This is what you do at the gym. Okay. And uh, you, know, you can just follow along, and we do all the programming for you. you know, we have about 2,600 videos on the site, all car- categorized from famous athletes to knee problems. To, you know, and it's, it's, we're really trying to create a primer for the human body, and that's, you know, that's, that's uh, what we've been doing through the site for the last um, – I think we started that in like 2000, you know. 11? Oh, wow. Maybe. So Maybe is, we officially start Mobility Wide in 2010. 2010. So are these courses that someone would sign up, pay a one time fee, or is it an ongoing fee and they get access to it? Or how does no, that work? No, no. It's one time fee if you want to, if you want to jump, drop into our world and know a little bit more about how to coach your, you know, your little league or okay. understand how to manage your tennis elbow. You know, all of those things are sort of addressed in there. Nice. And, um, you know, we, we recognize that. We have done a poor job culturally of empowering people to take take a crack at fixing themselves. And there's some very little, very low level, non skilled, you know, pieces. You know, if your knee hurts after a run, you shouldn't go see a doctor. You should take a crack at fixing it yourself. You're not injured. You just either you have a running technique problem or you know your your mechanics are a little bit off. And um, you know, but the problem is people have no idea what to do. And so then, you know, then we just go down this rabbit hole. Well, I'll stop running. You know, I'll go see 17 specialists. But you just have common knee pain from running, and you should know what to do to fix it. You should, you should do what your grandma said you should do to fix it, right? I mean, that, that's what we're trying to get back to. Yeah, and that's, and that's probably what you talk about in, in your book, Ready to Run, right? A lot of that stuff. That's right. That's right. Yeah. You, know, uh-huh. uh, you know, I think um, we've seen that the, the world is very sophisticated, and people are a lot smarter than I think we give them credit for. Uh-huh. And when you give people solutions that they experience and see, do themselves, they're grateful because people are a lot smarter than I think the medical profession, sports profession gives them credit for. Yeah, and really, like you said, I mean, t- taking care of yourself is really an easy thing. It's logical. It makes sense. It's super easy. It doesn't take a lot of time. It feels time, good. You know? sleep, you'll sleep better. Yeah. You'll run faster. I mean, this is not a uh, you know do this or else. This is a do this because, holy crap, you know that when you're... You know, when my daughter comes home and she's like, hey, my, my ankle hurts, Dad. My eight-year-old, who is a sprinting machine, <laughs> growing like a weed, yeah. you know, she's like, will you smash out my calf? And I'm like, yeah. She lays down on the ground. I put my foot, bare foot on her calf, and I just slowly roll back and forth and soften that up a little bit and reestablish the motion. She's, she's back out there. Wow. You know, she knows what to ask for. That's so cool. She's eight years old. Eight. That's awesome. That's awesome. All right, so your book is, I want to make sure and get this correct, it's called Deskbound, Standing Up to a Sitting World, and that's available on your website or Amazon or how do, how do people it's on that? Amazon if you go to amazon.com it's right there you'll you'll see it dude we, we have some we have some more big fun things in the uh, in the pipeline and uh, you know I think the world is ready I think we've seen you know when we started teaching this course a long time ago you know we would um, maybe 2008 uh-huh. you know um, I would say to people like hey this is your leg people are like this is amazing I have a leg thank you so much I just PR'd on my lifetime deadlift you yeah. know and now people have become so sophisticated and it's really fun to be able to sort of continue to advance this conversation. Well, it's cool. It's cool the work that you're doing and bringing all this stuff out because we're talking during um, the beginning of the show that wasn't recorded. Um, you know, right now as we're speaking, I think uh, Donald Trump is being inaugurated and you're talking about uh, Barack Obama and you're telling me before the show that he's got like a Fitbit, you said, right? 
Dude, he's got a Fitbit. He's got a gym in his house. He has a he has a physical therapist, strength coach. You know, he uh, he's awesome. you know the the whole family. I think is you know, Michelle Obama is a is a beast. He's a soul cycle machine, and I think it's important for us to understand that movement and physical capacity is a strength of our society Mm -hmm. and it doesn't take very much to just turn those knobs up and actually you know start to take off very very simple problems out of the medical system Mm -hmm. yeah a lot of people are waking up and like you said it's it's happening from the bottom up but it's also now starting to happen from the top down and people are awakening to this because of their own pain and injuries but then a lot of people are just waking up and realizing not just like oh i don't want to be in pain anymore but how can I improve? How can I be a, the best version of myself? How can I improve my times? How can I improve my lifts and all these other areas of life? So you got the crowd that's just sort of consciously awake that are asking, how can I be better? And then you're also having people that are in sick and pain um, also seeking out this kind of work. So it's, it's awesome that you're doing this. And well, you know, it. it's, um, we, we're going to cap, we're going to, we're going to have a talk with you eventually, whether that, you know, if you're injured whether you're losing, whether you're injured in losing, whether you're afraid of losing, mm-hmm. um, you know, if you're afraid of, you know, hey, I, you know, I'm 43 and my kids are starting to become sick athletes, and um, you know, I want to play volleyball and ski with them, and you know, and, and and compete and you know, play. And if I'm worried about my back or my knee, you know, that's no good for me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, good stuff. All right, so mobilitywad.com, and that's mobility and then wod.com as in workout of the day that's right mobilitywad.com check us out nice awesome thanks kelly for being on the show absolutely my pleasure thank you so much all right thanks kelly i'll talk to you soon well episode 504 dr kelly starrett what do you guys think about that that was a cool show i think that was like a kick in the pants kick in the butt for a lot of us that really need to hear that kind of information i thought it was Interesting. I like the way he, he speaks about so passionately about what he's doing there. And, um, and I think it's so, so important. How many people do you see that are walking around with their heads down? They're looking at their cell phones. I mean, if you go to an airport or bus stop or any public place like that, everyone is looking at their phone and they're sitting. And the effects that these are, these, this, type of lifestyle is having on our health is I think it's a cumulative effect and I think that it really does affect us in, in weird some some strange way that we'll probably never be able to scientifically verify or study but it affects our health on a cumulative level and I think that you know it kind of gets back into the work that Daniel Vitalis does over at uh, Sir Thrival um, we have his products in our store they're great products but a lot of his work is is based on the idea of rewilding and that is bringing ourselves back into alignment with nature and that's really what it's about that really is what it's about because if you look at what we've been doing i mean even going to a gym that's not natural N- nowhere in the wild will you see like a flat smooth surface you know even something is like a pull up bar you know you you don't find smooth surfaces you don't find right angles in nature I mean, this is all this this construct and this society and culture that we build for ourselves is so disconnected from nature, and that's what the work that we're doing here, and that's what the work of Daniel Vitalis does, uh, Dr. Kelly Starrett does over at Mobility Wad. I mean, it's just bringing basic movements back and basic f- philosophical mindsets back um, into our consciousness because we've been disconnected. Right? We've been disconnected from God. We've been disconnected from our spiritual path. We've been disconnected from uh, the earth, from the environment, f- from everything. And, and most of all, we've been disconnected from each other and from ourselves too, right? We've been disconnected from our own ability to understand what's going on in our own body. Right? We live in our head all day long. All we do is we think and think and ruminate and, and, and think about things. And it's a mental this, mental that. And we're always trying to compute and use our mind and use our head to to navigate life when we're in reality we should be listening to our body we should be living in our body you know and our head is just taking over control of our lives and of everything and so you know for me it's a constant reminder to make sure to bring back some natural ways of living and I you know I really do think that we as a society as a culture there's going to be a lot of blowback. I think a lot of people are going to finally wake up and start and start really wondering, you know, is this 
modern life? Is this really what it's all about? And is this causing us to be sick? I mean, you look at how many people are sick these days, young people getting diseases and, you know, um, older people coming down with diseases that dying earlier, 65, 75 years old, and we're supposed to be living a lot longer than that. You know, if you believe in the Bible, it says there that uh, the curse that God gave man was 120 years. That was the curse. Prior to that, if you believe the Bible, men were living to 900 years old. You know, maybe that's true. Maybe it's not. I don't know. But, I mean, it's interesting, right? Whether or not any of that's true is, is remains to be seen. But, you know, I find it interesting that we were cursed to live to 120. That was like the low. And we're, we're you know, 50 years lower than that. So what, what are we doing wrong? What's happening in our world? What's happening in our culture? Where are we going wrong? Or is it too much stress? Is it too much toxicity? Is it how we're using our body? It's got to be all those things, I would think. You know? So, you know, I, I think it's important to start chipping away at different areas of life that you can really look at and say, you know what, I think I can have dominion over this area of my life. I think I can get my diet under control or I think I can um, get my my ability to use my body in new and new and unique ways. I think I can get that under control. You know, so I think it's really important for us to to be strategic about the area of life that you think you will have the most success in. You know, some people it would be really easy for them to get a standing desk. Some people or maybe that same person would find it very difficult to to change their diet, right? So I think it's important to, to have strategy, you know, and much in the same way that like a boxer or a fighter would have a strategy or a, any pro sports team, they would, they would say, they would look at their opponent's Achilles heel and realize, okay, that's their weak spot. Let's go after that. And so you look at yourself, what are your strengths? Uh, what areas of your life could you have success in? And then you start working on that. So maybe it's, it's this ability to, to get a standing desk and to, um, just completely change how you use your body. And then once you start having success in that, then you tackle another area. Maybe you know uh, you, you know you find the next thing that you can that you can conquer with relative ease. And then after three or four of those, then you finally get to the hard stuff that you thought you never could fix. And because you've had success and you know what that success feels like, then you're like, okay, you know maybe I can start working on this area. And then you all of a sudden you have success with something you never thought you could overcome. And so. That's the work that we're doing here is trying to help people wake up a little bit more and for myself to wake up a little bit more and to start doing the things that are important for us to get reconnected with ourselves, with each other, with nature, and with God. You know, you if you're disconnected in any one of those areas, you're, you're going to have an issue um, in one of those areas in your life. And so, I don't know, it's really important, I think, to... Uh, to really look into, you know, the direction that your life is going and how you perceive yourself and and uh, what kind of person you're going to be in 20, 30, 40 years. You know, are you going to be sick? Are you going to be in a in a bed? Are people going to be taking care of you? Or, you know, how are you going to be moving, you know, throughout space and time when you're 70, 80, 90 years old? What are you going to be doing? How are you going to be helping people? And so <clears throat> I think that's really important. Um, I want to share with you just one of the things that I, I don't know what it was that caused me to decide finally to just say, you know what, I'm not making sitting an option. And I have to say, like I said during the show, I've been doing this for like, I don't know, 18, 19, 20 days now, and my feet still hurt. Every day, my feet hurt. Um, so I have to, you know, right after this, I'm going to, you know, stretch but it's cool because it allows my body to move. It allows me to move because one of the things that I try to do every day is I try to stretch every day, every single day. So I try to do passive stretches. Like during the show, I was stretching. Um, you know, I had my, uh, you know, I was balancing and, you know, I was moving around. I was using that mobility or that lacrosse ball. But, you know, if you can work it in during your day, it's it's the it's the best. And so what's cool is that I can use the standing as my default state and then I can use everything else as like a like a treat like okay I can finally sit now and so 
you know, after I'm done recording this, I'll do 10 minutes of stretching. Whereas if I were in my chair, I would just, I wouldn't do my stretching because I wouldn't need to, because I wouldn't feel like I was getting stiff. So it kind of makes you, it forces you to move, which is really cool. Um, I just decided, you know what? I don't want to, you know, have a disease or, you know, I, I don't want to have any health issues as a result of sitting. And, you know, the rebounder works your, pel- <coughs> excuse me, your pelvic floor. Like he was, he was talking about your pelvic floor and this um, adult diaper industry that's now booming. And we don't ask ourselves why we need these things. And so I do my rebounder every day. Um, one of the, one of the things that's been really helping me, um, with my pain in my, um, knee and my ankle and my feet as a result of standing more, I'm just, I'm basically changing my whole, my whole way of life because essentially what I'm doing is going from the standard American diet to a raw food diet, raw food vegan overnight. I mean, that's kind of the comparison of, of going from a lifetime of sitting to now standing. And so it's. It's very shocking to my body, and I'm just starting to see now the benefits. And I'm starting to get to the point now where I want to stand. I don't want to sit. And that's where you really want to be because you know the benefits. Like, I know the benefits of working out, so I want to work out. And I feel good, and I don't feel good when I don't. And I don't want to not feel good, so I work out so I can feel good and not feel bad. So it's a double... um, double-edged sword there, but what I was going to say about one of the tools that's been helping me a lot is that Rapid Release Pro that we have in our store. Man, that's been helping a lot. So what I'll do is, you know, if my feet really start to hurt, I'll go out in the other room and I have it um, in the other room and I'll go over my feet with that tool and oh my gosh, it just brings blood flow, it brings warmth, it brings circulation, it brings all these amazing and my feet feel like I've just got a massage. It feels really, really good. Um, that rapid release is pretty, it's a pretty awesome tool. And so um, if you have any pain on your body, you could use it. If you go to our store, there's a video there and you can learn more about what it can do for you and if it's something that you think would be good for you. I use it in a, a bunch of different ways, not just for pain, but for calcification breakdown in my joints, for stimulation of my organs and all kinds of cool stuff. So that's been helping me a lot um, with this whole standing thing. Um, but I think the idea, I just remembered who it was that I heard that from of the cast. And that is uh, Katie Bowman. And I forget what her name or her website name is. Let me see if I can find it really quickly. She's like a movement specialist as well. She's cool. Katie Bowman. Let's see. Nutritiousmovement.com. Nutritious Movement. Dot com, And uh, she was talking about the casting. And it's so true. It's so, so true. If you think of a metaphorical cast that is not physical, but works and operates in the same way that a physical cast works, you start realizing that everything is a cast. You know, looking, looking at something, if our eyes are only designed to, or if our eyes are designed to look at far distances, but we're looking only short distances, we're, we're putting a cast on our eyes. And by not exercising and letting it, letting it operate under the full extent of what it's supposed to be doing, and so by all of our modern comforts and our modern conveniences, we're putting a cast on ourselves. And by not exposing ourselves to cold, by not exposing ourselves to warmth, by not exposing ourselves um, to the elements by walking barefoot, by not exposing ourselves to um, sunshine without glasses and lack of clothing in the sunshine by by protecting ourselves from the modern not well, well I guess what would be the best way to say that by protecting ourselves and insulating ourselves we're we're making our our physiology and our genetic makeup weaker and that is rampant in every area of our life you know we we use light this really, really damaging kind of light that we use in the evenings, um, you know, and and everything that we do is basically a cast, and and it's it's uh, it's causing our genes and our genetic expression to only work within a limited bandwidth. If you think of like a pie, a piece of a pie, our genes are supposed to be the entire pie and have the ability to express itself in a variety of ways, but. When we do all these modern things, it's like we're only operating within that one slice of the pie. 
And so it becomes a cast. And so you become genetically weaker. And that's why we have, you know, degenerative diseases, which is literally our, we're being degened. And so that's part of the work that we're trying to do here is, um, bring health practices into our lives that allow us that full expression of our genes and our genetic expression. And so I think that standing is, it's a real, challenging thing because i'm doing this right now my feet are hurting a lot but i'm i'm it's important to me to to continue to do it it really is because i I understand the long-term benefits of it and um so i really was a big fan of kelly i love his work that was really cool i'm glad he was on the show we finally got him on the show i want to tell you about one thing too i found this the other day i don't know if you guys will be interested in something like this i for one am not but it all depends. Everyone has their own thing. I don't. I don't really. Uh, I think it uses. Yeah, it uses your cell phone. I don't. I don't have a cell phone. But this is something called. Um, it's a posture coach. Um, and it's called Lumo Body Tech. L U M O Body B O D Y Tech T E C H. Lumo Body Tech dot com. And basically, it's like you put a little electrode on your on your shoulder or maybe you put it on your neck somewhere and then it connects somehow to your smartphone and it, it, and it rings every single time that your posture is out of alignment and you're not, and you're leaning forward. Um, personally, I, I'm not into those t- kind of things because what it's doing is taking the place of, of our own ability to be connected with our bodies. So, you know, it's um, you know we're we're supposed to be in touch with how our bodies are feeling, how our body is operating, and all of the different functions of our body. And if we continually give those up to modern technology, I think something's lost there. It's sort of like how no one can remember a phone number these days because the f- the phone numbers are all in their phones, and so you're not using your mind and your brain in order to to memorize numbers. Um, Some would argue that, you know, that data, that information is not necessary and it just, it takes the place of more necessary data and information that should be in your brain or your mind, however you want to call it. But my contention is that that stuff is, um, you know, it, it, it does too much of the work for you. So anyway, but for, for those of you that are interested, it's called lumobodytech.com. You may want to check into that. And, um, I also wrote an article about the dangers of sitting. And you know, I estimated that uh, the average person, if you combine um, if you combine sleeping on top of sitting, you're doing both for about 18.8 hours every day. Out of a 24-hour day, you're either sitting or lying down for 18, almost 19 hours. That means only five hours is spent being erect. Isn't that crazy? That is just nuts to me. Women and men who both sat who both sat more and were less physically active were 94% and 48% more likely to die during um, the study period, respectively compared with those who reported sitting the least and being most active. Um, women have a 94% higher mortality rate if they sit all day than men who do not. 98% or 94%. So it's, it's crazy. It, this is really an epidemic, and I... Um, I invite you to go over and look at his website, mobilitywad.com. I hope you guys enjoyed that show. That was a really wa- wa- um, eye-opener for me. I hope you guys learned a lot from it. I'm going to start implementing a lot of um, his practices and the things he's got going on there. And uh, and if you, if you do the same, let me know how it goes for you. I'd really love to know more about that and how you are going with the stand-up desk. It's really, really, um, I think, very, very important. So anyway, thanks guys for your support. Thanks for listening. We love you guys so much. Thank you for your support on Amazon. If you would like to support the show on Amazon, it's one of the best ways to support the show. We've made it even easier for you to do that too. So now all you have to do is just do a one-time thing. Go to our website and on the right-hand side, you'll see a link that says, or a um, a banner for Amazon on the right-hand side. Below that, there's some blue text. If you click and drag that blue text to your desktop, that will create a an icon. And now all you have to do is use that icon every time you make an Amazon purchase. I'd probably rename the icon so you, you know, rename it Amazon Extreme Health Radio or something. 
Um, and that way you can go through that Amazon icon on your desktop to uh, support us. And that would be amazing. So you only have to do that once, but uh, for subsequent purchases, you just have to remember to go through the desktop icon there. So we appreciate that. And we appreciate your support by buying through our stores. Your constant support um, is amazing. And we love you guys so much for it. Uh, we're going to be continually adding new products to our store, all kinds of cool stuff on there right now. Uh, one of the things I want to let you guys know about too is that there are these weekly webinars going on right now if you're listening somewhat close to the time that we're recording this, which is Inauguration Day, January 20th, 2017. Uh, our good friend Marcus Freudenman from episode 490 on um, oxygen and ozone therapy, he, uh, he did a, he's doing these weekly webinars about the benefits of ozone. And uh, if you guys want access to that, uh, we'll put a link in this show page, um, extremehealthradio.com slash 504. And you can learn about ozone and get access to all the webinar replays um, that he's got going on about how to use ozone. And it's really easy. It's like five minutes every single day. He's got all these different protocols for leaky gut, digestion, Crohn's disease, um, cancer. He's got all kinds of protocols, um, fibromyalgia. And you can get access to all of that. So we'll put a link over to that. And um, yeah, our store's got lots of cool stuff. So thank you for considering going through our store. Anytime you're going to buy like a juicer, a blender, a rebounder, a dehydrator, any of those types of things, we have our saunas on the, sh- on the store. Um, just to let you know too, our sauna is going to be increasing in price by $165 starting February 1st, 2017. So uh, right now we're able to offer it, thankfully, for 1030 $1,030, and it's going to be going up to $1,195 um, starting February 1st, 2017. So um, if you're in the market to get one, I'd highly recommend getting one soon so you don't have to pay that extra $165. Um, unfortunately, we can't do anything about why that's it's going up. That's not in, in our control. So just want to let you guys know about that. And what else? Thanks, you guys, for your uh, support on Patreon. You guys are awesome. I really appreciate it. Patreon is a way to support the show, and we appreciate that a lot. You can donate a couple bucks a month. You can also do it on on PayPal as well. But if you like what we're doing, consider doing that. And uh, we really could use it, and our goal is to help a billion people. And we're growing like gangbusters, and we're helping so many people. And so your support allows us to do that, and so we're really excited about that. So thank you for... Um, for for supporting us in our efforts to help more people. That really is appreciative on our end. Uh, it's just great. So we have the best listeners in the world. You guys are amazing. Um, just so honored and blessed to be able to do this kind of work for you guys. And what else? What else? What else? What else? Any other shows? Let me just uh, give a little rundown of our upcoming shows. Let's see here. I've got some shows. Let me open up our calendar. Oh, Next Monday, uh, we're going to be doing a whole show on the rapid release technology. That will be really cool. Um, And then on the 24th, we're going to be doing a show with Andrew Fletcher, and he talks about the inclined bed therapy, Um, inclining the the head of your bed. And he talks about circulation and blood pressure, glaucoma, disease prevention. He's had some pretty impressive research um, about all of the amazing health benefits from simply raising the head of your bed up six six inches or so or 30 degrees or I forget what it is. Um, so we're going to be talking to him about that and uncover the research he's done there. And then we have Dr. Kevin Connors. We'll be talking about Rife technology. We have a Rife machine. We'll be talking about that. We'll be talking about uh, Rife and cancer and all kinds of cool stuff from uh, Dr. Kevin Connors. He's been on our show before too. Um, so you can search our archives and just search Connors. The way you spell his name is, let me just make sure you get this correct, C-O-N-N-E-R-S, Connors, Dr. Kevin Connors. So, um, and then we got lots of other shows coming up too. Good stuff going on here. So thank you guys for uh, all your support. We really love you. Uh, really just so grateful and honored and humbled that we're able to do this show for you and uh, hopefully help your life out in some way. So um, it just feels good. It feels good to be able to be a part of uh, humanity expanding their consciousness and waking up and taking control of their health and taking control of their lives and hoping making the world a better place. It's just, you know, we're doing one small piece of it and we all have our own piece and it just feels really good to be a part of that, you know. Um, I don't know. There's something u- uniquely satisfying for that. So 
Um, also, one other thing I want to let you guys know too is that we are going to be starting a membership community sometime in 2017, and we're laying the groundwork and the building the foundation for it right now um, for this exclusive. Um, private membership community that we're going to be building. And it's going to be a, a place for people to connect with one another. And possibly in the future, we'll do like live events or conferences and be able to meet up in person. But um, it's going to be a place for us to connect with each other and for me to be able to connect with you guys more because that's what I really want to do. But it, uh, right now, it's really challenging with all the work that I have to do to produce the shows. Um, and so... I really want to connect with you guys more. And so what we're going to be doing in this community is building a place where uh, we have different doctors come on and give protocols and create videos. And um, we're going to be taking Q&A questions and doing webinars and lessons and all kinds of cool stuff to really allow you to have access to cutting edge information that you won't get anywhere else that's, that, that covers everything. Like, you know, so I don't know if you guys know, but or have the same thoughts as I do, but you'll, you'll read an article online about, you know, maybe, um, how to, let's see how to overcome the flu or the cold or, you know, some kind of sickness. And you'll realize, wow, they left out so many pieces to that. Right. I think to myself, well, what about tapping, you know, the emotional freedom technique? What about the emotion code? What about rife machines? What about energy medicine? What about using frequency generators? What about using, um, homeopathics, you know, what about using, um, herbal teas and tinctures? What about, um, energy medicine and all kinds of different things that a lot of people just leave out when they, when they talk about, you know, building your immune system or overcoming the flu virus or something. And so what we're going to do is build protocols that are going to be ongoing. And so we're going to be continually adding to them on different levels, like, um, uh, spiritual principles, you know, the recall healing stuff we're going to be doing, um, adding so many layers to the depth of what you can do to tackle certain diseases or certain health challenges. And so we're going to be building all of that on, on an ongoing basis. So, uh, you know, if you have an opinion about what would make you excited about joining a membership community, let me know. And I'd love to hear your thoughts about what you would want as a part of this community. And the community is going to be a monthly paid membership. So it won't be for everybody. It will only be for people who really want to take their health to the next level, really want to make friends with other people in there online and, and potentially in person and really want to get access to cutting edge protocols and, and be really inspired to take care of themselves. So that's what we're going to be doing uh, in the membership site. So Extreme Health Radio is going to continue to exist. We're still going to do the shows, um, but we're also going to be doing this as well. So like I said, it'll be a paid membership community and you'll have access. Maybe we'll do things like seasonal cleanses that are overseen by doctors or um, all kinds. There's so many so many things that we could do here. So I'm really excited about um, being able to connect more with you guys and to be in, and the, the reach that we have in terms of access to doctors is pretty remarkable. So we have... Um, we're deeply entrenched in, in this whole world of natural healing. And so we have access to so many amazing people that can share their unique insights and we're going to be breaking everything up. Um, and so you'll be able to take, you know, um, ask your questions to doctors and, and we're going to be breaking everything up and into, um, different protocols and diseases. So there'll be long form content, like hour long episodes of things and videos, and there'll be short form content too, two, three, four minute clips on different um, ailments and things, as well as uh, written protocols and PDF format and stuff. So I'm really excited about this. This is something that I've wanted to do for a long time. I really want to have just a database of things that work um, and be able to access it at any time. Like in case you know somebody in our family has an ic- a sickness or an illness, I want to be able to just quickly log into the membership website and find all the protocols for that particular ailment and be able to work with that person or be able to work with myself. You know, if I come down with a flu or something like that, I want to be able to, um, you know, quickly and easily get access to all that information. So that's what we're going to be building. If that's something that sounds cool to you, stay tuned for it. We'll put a link to it uh, at this show page, extremehealthradio.com slash 504. And uh, as soon as it launches, you'll be able to get access to that and uh, learn more about it. Um, I will say, though, um, when we first launch, there's going to be a, a discount, Um for the first week that we launch. And so um, it'll be a lifetime discount too. So, um, you know, I'd highly recommend signing up during that first week because it would be nice to give everyone a discount who signs up during that time. Um, and then after the week goes away, um, it'll go back to the normal price. And then 
over time, it will be increasing in price as well. So if you get in on, on that discount, it's going to be just a forever kind of a thing, unless you cancel and then want to sign up again. Um, and then it'll, you'll have to pay the regular price. So, um, yeah, if you can't get in during that discount period, that would be the most ideal. And, uh, anyway, hope you guys enjoyed that show. That was awesome. Go check out mobilitywad.com, mobilitywad, W-O-D.com. And, uh, you can check out what Kelly's got going on and, and make sure if you get his book through Amazon, go through our link. If you can't, if you could, if you want to support the show, becoming a supple leopard. Uh, ready to run and desk bound standing up to a sitting world. Pretty cool stuff, man. I like what he's up to. Really nice guy. Um, so anyway, thanks guys. I love you and, um, hope you guys are having a great day and I'll talk to you soon. No material on this blog is intended to suggest that you should not seek professional medical care. Always work with qualified medical professionals, even if you educate yourself in the field of live food, nutrition, and alternative medicine. I'm not a doctor, nor am I offering readers medical advice of any kind. None of the information offered here should be interpreted as a diagnosis of any disease, nor an attempt to treat or prevent any disease or condition. While information in this blog is discussed in the context of numerous conditions, it can be dangerous.